Good morning uh, to everybody. Uh, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the second conference in this series of seminars in which, as you know, the Campus Del Mar program brings uh, a recognized expert in the field of uh, oceanic science and technology every month to give us a talk on a topic related to those. Uh, today we have the honor to have Professor Gerd Lewis from Delft University of Technology as speaker. He uh, received his PhD degree in electrical engineering from Catholic University of Leuven in Belgium in year 2000. Uh, he was also a postdoctoral research fellow there until 2003. Uh, he has been a visiting researcher at Stanford University and at the University of Minnesota. And currently he is an associate professor at the Faculty of Electrical Engineering, Mathematics and Computer Science at Delft University of Technology in the Netherlands. He is the author of over 40 journal and 100 conference papers. And he has received numerous awards, including an IEEE uh, Signal Processing Society Young Author Best Paper Award in 2002 and an IEEE Signal Processing Society Best Paper Award in 2005. Professor Leus is a senior member of the IEEE and he serves or has served in the past on the editorial boards of several of the most prestigious journals in the fields of uh, signal processing and communications. Until very recently, he also served as the chair of the IEEE Signal Processing Society, uh, Signal Processing for Communications and Networking Technical Committee. Uh, and very importantly for us, he's also a member of the International Advisory Board for the Campus Domar program. Professor Leus is one of the world leading researchers in the field of signal processing applied to communications. And one of the areas related to this field in which he is very active is uh, underwater acoustic communications, which is the topic of his presentation today. So, Gert, thank you very much for being with us today, and the stage is all yours. Okay. So, thank you, Roberto, and thank you also to the University of, of uh, Vigo and the Campus do Mar program for inviting me here. It's, it's always a, a pleasure to, to come to this area. I've been here a couple of times before with the Bayona workshop and I really had a good time here so I, I really it's nice to, to be back here. So today I will talk about uh, multi-carrier communications for uh, underwater uh, environments and I would like to acknowledge the, the funding agency, the national funding agency in the Netherlands, SDW and also the Defense uh, Institute, TNO, uh, who we uh, collaborate with in this uh, field of uh, underwater communications. And then also some people from the Delft uh, University of Technology and the University of Perugia in Italy, uh, who we also uh, closely uh, collaborate with uh, in this area. Uh, first, maybe a few words about uh, our uh, research group which is actually uh, embedded in the microelectronics uh, division of our faculty. So we're not really a telecom division, we're in the microelectronics division. And the group is, is called uh, Circuits and Systems. And we work on, on many types of applications. Uh, some of them are communications, but also uh, radio astronomy uh, applications and some, some biomedical applications also. And uh, there are some professors, including myself, working on the algorithmic side with signal processing algorithms for communications, also for radio astronomy, so in general array processing. And then there are also a number of people working on the architectures uh, from high level uh, design and, and system uh, methodology, but also uh, VLSI uh, chip design and even design uh, verification. And leading to lots of implementations on uh, FPGAs, on embedded systems, uh, and actually also on some, some ASICs that uh, people are building but I'm inside the, the algorithm uh, part of our group. Now the outline of this talk, so first I will give a, a general overview of uh, underwater communications, what, what this is about, what are the applications. Then I will focus a little bit more on the, the UCAC project, which was a European defense project we were involved in. It stands for uh, UUV, so un Unmanned Underwater Vehicle Covered <coughs> Acoustic Communications. Uh, and then I will uh, switch to some more uh, technical details on multi-carrier communications for underwater, com for underwater environments. So more specifically, uh, orthogonal frequency division multiplexing, or OFDM. I will look at uh, how to equalize the underwater environment in that, in that uh, setup, how to estimate the channel. So the channel in this context is basically the underwater environment. 
and uh, we'll also look at some uh, extensions uh, of these uh, equalization and estimation techniques. And then I will also discuss how we applied this multi-carrier uh, modulation, this OFDM, which is also used, for instance, in, in, in Wi-Fi systems, how we applied it to this uh, uh, UCAC uh, project. So first of all, uh, underwater communications, there are many different applications. You can think about uh, uh, equipment monitoring, for instance, uh, pipelines, or here in Vigo, you could think about monitoring the, the muscle platforms, for instance. But you can also think about patrolling of, of ports, harbors, uh, ship narrowboats, so around your ship to, to patrol that area. Or you could think about coordinating uh, uh, autonomous underwater vehicles like this one here that you could control uh, with, with this mothership. This is actually an application that we will talk about within this uh, UCAC project. So, uh, and there are different requirements. You could think about uh, real-time traffic that you need for, for instance, uh, monitoring but you could also think about very bursty traffic, uh, periodic traffic that, that you need. Uh, other issues are reliability, disposability of sensor nodes. Energy efficiency is of course also important if you have these moored sensors that are floating around in the water and, and okay, you, you need to give them some energy. So here you see, let's say a general underwater uh, communication setup where you have these you know, uh, acoustically connected uh, sensors which are uh, moored on the, which are on the, on the seafloor, or you have these moored sensors, or maybe even cabled seafloor sensors that are all communicating to each other. Uh, you could have also these uh, autonomous underwater vehicles that are uh, there, and some, some surface sinks in the form of a ship, or some surface stations that are communicating to, to these uh, sensor nodes. So this is a, a very complicated but general setup that, that you could envision for uh, an underwater communication uh, system. Now, if you want to set up a, an underwater communication link, for instance, between this uh, uh, autonomous underwater vehicle and the ship, for instance, then what do we have to do? How are we going to organize that? So you could think, first of all, to use maybe electromagnetic waves like in uh, uh, radio communications, right? But they tend to fade very rapidly in, in underwater environments. So you cannot reach very large distances. Now, some people have built systems to cover very large distances with these type of uh, systems, but they need very, they need very large antennas. And uh, people have built actually uh, loop antennas, which are uh, looped around an island. So they are really kilometers in, in diameter. So they're really big. So it's not very practical to, to use those in the, in the applications that I just uh, discussed. Another option is to look at optical communications. So in that case, you can reach very high bit rates over short distances, but you have problems of high dispersion and attenuation if you think about longer distances. And you also need to align your, uh, your uh, transmitter and receiver. So that's also not very practical in, in some applications. So that's why the, the technology of choice today is to use acoustic waves uh, to uh, communicate underwater because they acoustic communication kind of supports all the the required uh, transmission ranges that you, you need for those systems. Now, what are some properties of, of acoustic communications in an underwater environment? Of course, first of all, you have a, a low propagation speed. We're talking here about 1500 meters per second. So that's very small compared to radio waves, of course. So if you want to travel a distance of, let's say, 15 kilometers, it will take you 10 seconds to get there. And for the, the, the physical layer that we will discuss today, so uh, let's say recovering bits from a transmitted signal, it's not that important. But if you want to build a network, uh, like we just uh, saw before, like if you want to build here a network between all these nodes, then it becomes important because uh, every uh, communication signal that you're going to send, it's going to travel several seconds. So if you want to do a lot of handshaking, like in wireless network protocols, it becomes very complicated. So that's why underwater networks, it's a real chal challenge to, to build uh, good networks for those uh, applications. Uh, what's important though for the physical layer is that you have uh, a severe delay and, and Doppler spread, especially in the horizontal channel. So what does this mean? So you get the delay spread means that if you send a pulse in time, it will really spread out in time because of all the, the reflection paths. And you don't only have reflections against surface waves or the, the bottom, uh, 
but you also have reflection against other layers of water because the propagation speed of, of the sound depends actually on the depth of the water. And that's why you also get some bending of the pots against other layers of water. So it's a very uh, complicated uh, channel. You also have Doppler spread. That means if you send a certain frequency, it will spread out in, in frequency. So if you send, let's say, uh, 10 kilohertz, you might receive a spread of, uh, from, from 10 plus 1, 10 kilohertz plus 1 hertz, and, or, or 10 kilohertz minus 1 hertz, for instance. So you get some spread of the, of the frequencies. Uh, and that's due to mobility, mobility of the transmitter, of the receiver, but also the waves that are mobile and, and all kinds of scatterers in the environment that are basically moving. And that causes this, these high uh, Doppler spreads. Uh, also, the vertical channel is completely different from the horizontal channel. So the, the vertical channel is actually a little bit more easier to communicate over than the horizontal channel. So you have an, an anisotropic propagation, that, which is also in contrast to uh, radio communications. Also important is the frequency dependent attenuation and noise in the underwater environment, which also leads to a, a frequency and a distance dependent bandwidth. Uh, for instance, here you see a plot where we show basically the received signal to noise ratio versus the frequency for different uh, distances. For instance, if you want to communicate over a distance of one kilometer, then this red curve here shows you the received signal to noise ratio uh, at the receiver for different frequencies. So the optimal carrier frequency to use over that distance is somewhere around 20 kilohertz. And if you look at the 3 dB, the optimal 3 dB bandwidth that you can use is kind of 25 kilohertz. And you see that the optimal carrier frequency will shift, will increase if you go to shorter distances, and also the bandwidth increases a little bit. But if you go to higher distances, let's say 10 kilometers, which we have to do for this UCAC project, for instance, we'll talk about that later on, then actually your carrier frequency has to, has to drop down and the bandwidths, the bandwidths that you can use are just a, a few kilohertz. So that's why it's, it's very important to know what are the average distances you have to communicate over because that will depend your, your system design and what bandwidth you're going to use and what carrier frequency you're going to use. And that's completely different from, from uh, radio communications. And you already see here that we're talking now about uh, bandwidths in the range of kilohertz and tens of kilohertz. So it's much lower than, than of course, in electromagnetic communications where we can send megabits and, and gigabits per second. So we have limited bandwidth. So that's just something we have to live with in the acoustic world. So here you see actually an overview of the, the, the major differences between radio communications and acoustic communications. I think most of them we have uh, covered. Uh, for instance, in radio also you have typically white noise, while in the underwater uh, environment you generally have to consider frequency dependent noise. Noise that's coming from, uh, okay, you can have all kinds of shipping noise, all kinds of ship that, that ships that make uh, sounds. You have uh, noise from turbulence, you have noise from uh, wind. So th there's a lot of frequency dependent noise in, the, in an acoustic environment. Also, the nodes in the acoustic world are generally bulky and, and kind of expensive, especially if you want to go to low frequencies, the, the, the transducers, they become very bulky. Uh, especially if you compare this to the, the small and cheap nodes in the, in the radio environment. Uh, also, in the acoustic world, it's kind of hard to do experiments and, and there's kind of a lack of, of simulation tools. And this is easier in, in, the, in the radio world. So that kind of uh, covers a little bit of uh, a small overview of, of underwater communications and the differences with, with radio communications. Now let's focus a little bit on the, the UCAC project, which stands for this uh, underwater, uh, unmanned underwater vehicle covert acoustic communication. So the focus there was to establish a covert communication link. So covert meaning that it was, it's difficult to intercept uh, the signals. So it should be transmit, it should be, uh, wor it should work at very low uh, signal to noise ratios. And this was a, collaborating, uh, a collaboration between different uh, European nations um, which you can see here. And the, the basic uh, project goal was to identify and, and demonstrate also adequate methods for such a covert uh, acoustic communication link uh, to and from such an underwater vehicle and uh, a mothership that is several tens of kilometers away from the underwater vehicle. So we're talking low 
low data rates here, but just some to, to send some control signals to and from the, the underwater vehicle um, from, from a mothership. That, that's the basic goal. That was the basic goal of this, of this project. Um, so as I already mentioned, because we go at, at ver because we want to use uh, long uh, distances, we have to go for uh, a small carrier frequency. Uh, so and we used actually two. We had two transducers, one with a carrier frequency of 3.3, one with a carrier frequency of 5. And the overall bandwidth that we were working with was 3.6 kilohertz, so a very small uh, bandwidth. And different nations were testing different uh, modulation formats. Uh, the Swedish, they were testing spread spectrum communications, which is basically used in, in the 3G wireless systems. Uh, the Netherlands, so ourselves, we were checking this multi-carrier modulation, this O of the M. And there was also Italy that was checking the chirp modulation. So a chirp is basically a signal that, that sweeps in frequency. So this is basically mimicking how dolphins or whales communicate to each other. So they often use these type of chirp uh, signals. Uh, other parts of the project uh, involved uh, channel modeling and also transducer design because for these low frequencies there were actually no, uh, no transmitters and receivers available on the market. So there was uh, one company in Denmark, Raison, that was involved in this project and they actually built uh, such a transducer for these uh, operating uh, parameters. Now we focused on, uh, so we focused on, on multi-carrier modulation and uh, so these three uh, modulation formats were uh, tested in, in some C trials. So here you actually see an overview of the C trial. So the first C trial was basically based just on channel probing, so estimating the, the channel, how was the, 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 the channel uh, looking like so that we could basically um, set our parameters for the different modulation uh, formats accordingly. And those modulation formats were then tested in a second C trial and they were compared with each other. And actually the multi-carrier came out to be the best, but of course it also depends on what type of uh, chirp and what type of CDMA uh, system uh, that, you, that you implement. But for, for the systems that were tested, the multi-carrier uh, was the best, so the one that I dis will discuss today. And that one was then also in a third C trial demonstrated in an actual setup where we used this uh, unmanned uh, underwater vehicle from, uh, from uh, Sweden. And here is the, the low frequency transducer where, these multi where this modu mul multi carrier modulation was implemented on. Uh, so this is the large uh, transducer. This one is a, the standard transducer that is connected to this underwater vehicle. So this was just a, uh, let's say, a backup uh, transducer that was used to control the vehicle. And this was the, the transducer under test. But I will talk about uh, some of these C trials uh, later on. So let's now move to a, a bit more the technical part. So on the, the multi-carrier modulation that we adopted for this underwater environment, where you have to remember that the Doppler effects are the, are the strong, uh, important effects that you have to uh, take care of in this, in this case. Now what is, very simply put, what is multi-carrier modulation? Well, normally you put, uh, you put your information on a single carrier. So you basically control the phase based on the, the information that you want to send. So if you send a zero bit, you for instance uh, put your phase at zero degrees. When you send a bit one, you put your phase of your carrier at uh, 180 degrees. Right? Now in a multi-carrier system, you just put different data streams in parallel to each other over different uh, carriers that you send. And when you send such a multi-carrier signal over a linear time invariant system, and you know from your signals and systems classes that the frequency doesn't change when you send it over a linear time invariant system. So if I send in a frequency, what comes out, out of the linear time invariant system is the same frequency, just only the amplitude and the phase have changed. Actually now we're talking about a time varying system because the underwater channel is, is time varying. So the different carriers, they will shift. Uh, so they will start interfering with each other. So you get intercarrier interference and the different carriers will lose their orthogonality. And one very simple way to solve this problem is just to decrease the data rate and put more energy in every bit to overcome that interference problem. But okay, this is not very elegant, so we want to look at, at improved receivers, still low complexity, that do not require such a decrease in, in the data rate due to the intercarrier interference. And that can also even exploit this do so-called Doppler diversity. So the fact that the channel is time varying, you can actually take advantage of that because you know that sometimes the channel is bad, 
Sometimes the channel is good. So if I send a certain bit, but I only reserve a small time frame for that bit, if I'm unlucky, then during that time frame, the channel is very bad and I lose the bit. But if I spread out the bit over a longer time period, and I do that with all the bits, then the chance that my channel in that long time period is good at some point is, is high. So I can always recover part of the, of the bit. And that's basically exploiting some kind of Doppler diversity in a way. And we also try to do that in, in our receivers. So the focus is on simple one-shot receivers, but of course you can extend that to uh, iterative receiver architectures, and I will come back to that later on a little bit. Now, what is O of M? So a little bit of mathematics here. Uh, so actually, it's very simply put, it's kind of a convolution that you carry out. So you can assume that all your information bits are in these X samples here, and they are sent over the channel, and we simply model the channel here as, an, as a finite impulse response filter, that's H. And this is your output Y, your output sample. So what you see here is nothing else than a convolution. So it's an FIR filter that's applied to this uh, X signal. The only difference here is that the uh, filter also depends on this index N, which is this time index uh, that you take your output samples. So it means that your filter is actually time varying. So you do a convolution, but it's a time varying convolution. So your filter changes every time instant. And here you have Vn, this is just the noise at time instant N. Right? So normally, if you have a normal convolution, it would be H sub L times Xn minus L. So now we have this additional uh, N index here, which indicates that the filter is time varying. If you put that in a matrix vector form, so you can stack all your X samples in this vector X bar here, and this is multiplied with this channel matrix H bar, and this gives your output vector Y, which collects all these output samples Y. And so in this H bar matrix, every row here will contain basically the impulse response of the channel at that time instant. So if in a case of a time invariant channel, all the diagonals will be the same, so it will be a two-plits matrix. But in the general case of a time varying channel, it will not be uh, the case. So this is what happens in the, in the time domain, right? So this is a time domain representation. So in the time domain, you just get a, a convolution uh, of your signal with the channel. Now what is done in, in, in OFDM is they, they use a so-called cyclic prefix to transform the linear convolution into a circular convolution. And how do you do that? Well, ju by just copying the top part of this vector x to, to make sure, that the copying basically the, the lower part of this vector x bar to the top part. So these shaded areas here, they are exactly the same. And this allows you to rewrite this equation like this. So we have a, the x factor multiplied with this h matrix, which is the same as this h bar matrix, but it's just wrapped around. So every row again is the, 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 the impulse response of the channel but it's cyclically shifted. Now, why do we want to go for a circular convolution? Well, we know that a circular, co circular convolution can be represented by a multiplication if you use a uh, discrete Fourier transform. So a circular convolution in the time domain becomes a multiplication in the, in the frequency domain. And that's easier to handle because in a way, I want to recover these X samples from the Y samples. And to recover that, I have to invert this channel matrix H. But this to invert this one, it's kind of complicated, but if I can diagonalize this one, then it's easy to, to invert it. So if we look at how this circular convolution looks like, so for time invariant channels, so every row basically here contains the impulse response of the channel, but it's shifted over one sample. So this is a classical circular convolution, and it's called also a circular matrix. Right? But in a time varying case, all these filters, they are shifted, but they are also different. Right? So you see that on a single diagonal, we don't have the same values there because the channel varies even within one of the M symbol because the, the Doppler effects are so big that we cannot uh, assume that the channel is static over one of the M symbol. Now, what happens in O of the M? So like I said, this circular convolution actually in the time invariant case can be uh, diagonalized by DFT operations because it, it actually boils down to the fact that uh, in the frequency domain, this circular convolution becomes a product. So that's then what, what is done in the OFDM system. So here inside, you see what happens in the time domain. So this is what we had before. So y is equal to h times x plus v. But now we encode the data in the frequency domain, in this s vector. We go to the time domain through uh, an inverse discrete Fourier transform operation. 
And at the receiver, we go back to the frequency domain by means of a discrete Fourier transform operation, right? And all these blocks together can be represented like this. So this is the representation of what happens in frequency domain. And this A matrix is nothing else than the H matrix, but now in the frequency domain. And so in the time invariant case, this A matrix that we have to invert, because again, from Z, I want to recover S now at the receiver. So I have to invert this A matrix. And in time invariant case, it's very simple. The A matrix is just a diagonal matrix. <coughs> again, because a circular convolution looks like a product in the frequency domain. So here we don't have any intercarrier interference. So if I send a symbol on the first carrier, it's, it will only affect the first sample of Z by <coughs> means of this parameter by this scalar here. So we only get an amplitude and a phase change of every carrier. But in a time varying case, we actually get a fully loaded matrix. It turns out that most of the energy is still concentrated around the main diagonal, but still there are some off-diagonal elements which represent this interference between the different carriers. So we basically have to invert this uh, <coughs> matrix A if we want to recover S from, from uh, Z. And many people have been working on that. Uh, there are different methods to invert this matrix. I, I say now inversion, but in, in practice this happens. Uh, this will done in a minimum mean square error sense. So it's not just inverting the matrix, but we also take noise effects into account. And here is a, a, an overview in one slide of all these different methods that people have uh, been proposing for inverting such a channel matrix. So some of these methods here in the first column Actually, they don't take into account that most of the power is around the main diagonal. So they basically, for instance, just invert the full matrix, uh, which is not very clever because that gives you a complexity which is uh, cubic in the number of uh, active carriers if you want to do the full matrix inversion. Uh, but probably that's the best, the, that gives you the best uh, performance. So that's a block equalizer because you recover the whole block at once and it's non-banded because you don't take this uh, fact into account that you have most of the power around the main diagonal. It's also possible to devise a serial equalizer. What does this mean? Well, it means that if you want to recover, for instance, the fifth carrier here, then I'm going to take a linear combination of the fourth carrier, the fifth carrier, and the sixth carrier, and I'm going to do that in an optimal way to recover my fifth carrier. And I do that also for the sixth carrier and so on. And what this means mathematically is that we somehow have to invert this fat uh, orange matrix here, this orange uh, rectangular, I have to invert this or take a pseudo inverse. And that complexity is actually linear in the long dimension. So that's good because I avoid this cubic complexity. So to recover the fifth carrier, I need a complexity that, that's linear in the number of carriers. But I have to do that for every carrier. So in total, I still get a complexity that is quadratic in the number of carriers. So it's already better than this one, but it's still quadratic. To go to a linear complexity in the number of carriers, you have to exploit the fact that most of the energy is concentrated around the main diagonal, like is done in, in these two uh, works. So then we're talking about banded equalizers. So what we basically assume there is that you just have a few diagonals here that are non-zero, and all the other diagonals, which are far away, they're just simply assumed to be zero. Uh, so we basically set them to zero, although they're not equal to zero, but we assume that they're equal to zero. And then you can again do the full block inversion, and you can then devise actually simple methods to take into account the banded structure of this matrix to do the full inversion. And that gives you, I mean, we've shown that in a, in a publication in 2005 that you can do this also with linear complexity. Or you can again look at a serial equalizer where you again try to recover the fifth carrier by an optimal combination of the fourth, the fifth, and the sixth carrier. But now, because of the bandedness, you only have to invert this small orange matrix here which has dimensions independent of the number of carriers. But I have to do this for every carrier again, so that's why I get a complexity that's linear in the number of subcarriers. So these are the, the approaches that, are, that have a good complexity. And both of them more or less have the, the same uh, complexity. We will look at the performance uh, uh, later on. So now you could wonder, of course, okay, why do we actually now work in the frequency domain? Because here we, ca we kind of have to invert a banded matrix. But if we stay in the time domain, uh, like here, we also had, we have a banded matrix. So why not work in the time domain and, and forget about O of the M? Is it still useful to use O of the M in such an environment? Well, it turns out that the, the, band, the bandwidth here of this matrix is much larger than the bandwidth in the frequency domain. So basically, the delay spread is more severe than the Doppler spread. So it's better to work in the frequency domain and 
uh, remove the Doppler spread than to work in the time domain and remove the delay spread. So that's why it's still useful to work with multi-carrier modulation in such an environment, because here I only have maybe four or five sub-carriers that I have to deal with, while the number of channel taps could be uh, in the order of uh, tens or, or hundreds. Right? So that's why it's still favorable to look in, in this domain. Now, like I said before, we assume here that, that some carriers, some uh, of diagonals are set to zero, but in practice they're not set to zero. So we make, an, uh, we make an error there. We make an approximation and you see that also in the performance. So you get kind of a, a saturation of the bit error rate uh, at high SNR. Now you can improve that by doing some kind of time domain windowing. And that's what we also uh, propose for this uh, underwater communications. So compared to the OFDM uh, block, we will add here a windowing block. So we will window the received vector in the time domain. Here, so it basically corresponds to a multiplication with a diagonal matrix. So again, it's a very simple complex uh, complexity-wise. It's linear in the number of subcarriers. So you get an improved uh, uh, banded assumption. So what is the windowing doing? It's actually forcing all the energy inside the bandwidth. So you could compare it to channel shortening, but in the Doppler domain and not in the time domain. Uh, in, in ADSL, for instance, people have uh, devised filters to compress the channel in the, in the time domain. But here we try to compress all the energy of the channel in the, in the, in the Doppler spread. Um, so you can see an example here. So this is the time invariant channel. So this is a representation of, of this A matrix, right? Where the, the, the Z axis basically indicates the amplitude of the elements in this A matrix. So here it's only the diagonal that's active. Here you see that most of the power is around the diagonal, but you see some non-zero elements also uh, uh, on the other uh, off-diagonal, uh, off-diagonals. So that's for a time-varying channel. And when you apply windowing, you also have energy around the main diagonal, but you see that we only allow for non-zero entries in a certain range. And beyond that range, we try to set all the channel taps to zero. So we allow for intercarrier interference, but we allow only a limited amount of intercarrier interference. So it's really a kind of a channel shortening, but in the frequency domain. And the difference also with uh, channel shortening is that this window will be designed based on the statistics of the channel, not on the channel itself. So we don't need knowledge of the channel to design the optimal window. We just use statistics knowledge. While in general, in the time domain, channel shortening usually is based on knowledge of the channel itself. Here you see some performance uh, results for, uh, this was a, a set up with 128 subcarriers, eight channel taps, and some Doppler spread, which is 15% uh, of the carrier spacing. So the blue ones are the block equalizers, so where you treat the whole block at once, and the red curves are the serial uh, equalizers. When you see Q2 there, that means that you have basically uh, two, su two super diagonals and two sub diagonals that are assumed to be non-zero, so you have a bandwidth of, of five. So the band here, uh, sorry, the bands, the band here is assumed to be five diagonals that are assumed to be non-zero. And you see that if we don't do any windowing or if, we, or if we do a rectangular window, then we get a performance with the crosses here, the blue one. Also for the, for the red one, they're more or less close to each other. So without windowing, doing a block equalizer or a serial equalizer is more or less the same. But when you start applying windowing, a simple Hamming window even, or the optimal windowing here the, the, with the pluses or the circles, you see that the block equalizers, they get better. So this is with the Hamming window, and this is with the optimal window. So you get an improved performance, uh, improved uh, saturation level of the bit error rate for the uh, windowed equalizer. So here we see, and so this is the bit error rate versus the signal to noise ratio, or the bit energy over the noise uh, energy. But the red, the serial equalizers, actually you see there that when you go from the crosses to the, to the Hamming window, you get a little bit worse. And even if you do the optimal window, which actually was proposed in the past, uh, you actually get worse. So it seems that although you force all the intercarrier interference into this band, the serial approach, approach is actually doing worse. And it's not yet clear why this is, why this is true. Uh, the windowing was proposed for the serial case in, in, for an iterative receiver. So for the iterative receiver, we see that this in iterations drops down again. So the, iterate, 
the iterative uh, receiver benefits from the window, but it seems that if you do a single receiver, a one-shot receiver, then it's better not to use windowing if you use the serial approach. But for the block approach that, that we proposed, you see an improvement even in the first iteration for a one-shot receiver. Now, all these receivers here, they assume perfect channel knowledge, right? But of course, the big problem in, in underwater communications is estimating this channel. So I basically have to estimate the values in this A matrix here, or I have to estimate the values in this H matrix here. Right? And of course, how many values do I have to estimate? Well, we have here the channel length, which could be, if you have a channel of order L, it's L plus one. And every channel tap has actually yeah, N unknown coefficients, where N is the number of subcarriers. So we have a lot of unknowns to estimate, actually more than we have subcarriers. So even if I would put, even if I perfectly know my X, I don't have enough information to estimate all my parameters here. So somehow we have to reduce the number of unknown parameters and we can do that by uh, exploiting the correlation uh, within a channel tap. So the channel tap doesn't vary, uh, vary it doesn't vary randomly from one uh, time instant to the next, so it goes uh, smoothly. So you have a smooth time variation that you can exploit. And we exploit this correlation of the channel taps through a so-called basis expansion model. So here, for instance, in blue, you see the variation of a single channel tap in time. And you see it, it varies kind of smoothly. It doesn't go very noisy up and down. So and you can exploit that information. Uh, for instance, what you could do is if you stack all these values of the blue curve in, in one vector here, so this is for the L channel tap, how it evolves in time, you could express that as a linear combination of a number of basis functions, a limited number of basis functions. So here we could have, for instance, uh, 256 values, and these values here could be only five. So we reduce basically the number of uh, unknowns a lot. And what kind of basis functions do we choose? Well, we could use, for instance, polynomials. And here you see in, in red, that's the, the, the polynomial approximation for this blue curve, so it's pretty good. So here you see the different basis functions. So you get a linear value, uh, you get a DC value, a linear curve, a quadratic curve, a cubic curve, and a fourth order term. So these are five uh, basis functions that make up for this blue curve here if you add them all together. So that's a possibility. You could also think about so-called complex exponential basis expansion uh, models, where you basically uh, assume that your basis functions are sinusoids or complex sinusoids. Uh, and then also, depending on how you, how you take the period of the sinusoid, if you take it equal to the, the block length or longer than the block length, you can have a so-called critically sampled complex exponential band or, a, or, or an oversampled complex exponential band, which is a little bit better than, than this one. But okay, it's not so important to, to go into these uh, basis expansion models. We've been looking at that uh, in, 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 many, in, in much detail and, and checking different uh, models for channel estimation. But it's very crucial to use such a model that can exploit this, this correlation to reduce the number of unknowns. Then, okay, we've been using these uh, BAM models not only for uh, training-based channel estimation like here, but also for uh, blind estimation and, and semi-blind estimation. But, but in this underwater project, we were planning to estimate the channel based on training data. So basically, this is this S factor again, and some of this data is unknown, but some of the data are used as pilots, which means that we assume that the shaded areas here are perfectly known. So these are training data that we use to estimate the channel. At the receiver, we take then also these yellow blocks here. So these are corresponding uh, received samples that we select. And we group them all together to get a data model. And so all these uh, samples together, they form the so-called ZP vector. And that CP vector so consists basically of a part that's related to the channel times the pilots. There's also an interference part that depends on the channel and actually a few unknown data because we know that although the channel here is banded, it's actually fully loaded. So there are all the, the values are non-zero, although most of the energy is around the diagonal, but we have to take that interference into account. And you have noise. So uh, changing... Uh, 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 working with the equations a little bit, you can end up with this equation here, where these received samples can be written as a matrix which contains all the pilots times these basis expansion model coefficients. So that's a, a vector of reduced coefficients. Uh, 
So now this is much smaller than the actual number of unknowns in the channel. And then you have an interference term which consists of noise here and also uh, a matrix containing unknown data symbols and also the channel. So it's a classical linear model where you can estimate C, for instance, using least squares uh, from ZP. The only difference here is that the interference or the noise depends also on the unknown. So you could do a, a little bit more sophisticated things to take that interference term into account and do some iterative channel estimation and so on. But just remember that the basic trick to, to, to estimate the channel is to reduce the number of unknowns using this uh, basis expansion model. And here you see some uh, performance curves. Uh, so the blue lines are the, uh, with the estimated channel and the red lines are the corresponding equalizer with the true channel. So you see that we don't lose much. Of course, we pay a price for it because we, we spend a lot of uh, symbols to training. So there's a lot of training involved here. So that's the price you pay for that. Uh, we see different equalizers here. So, um, but I think, uh, yeah, it's not that important to go into the detail of these different receivers. I think what's important is to see that the estimated channel is close to the, to the true channel. Then some extensions that we've been looking at uh, are uh, decision feedback equalizers. So, so far I just talked about inverting the A matrix, but you can do more clever things such as a, a block decision feedback equalizer, uh, which also turns out to be a linear, uh, to have a linear complexity in the block size and uh, can be again carried out with or without windowing. You can also think about soft versions of these equalizers that we discuss and take the quality of the, of the symbol estimates into account. So if you have a channel code that allows you to, to say something about the quality of the symbol estimates and you can use that in your equalizer design. And if you run that iteratively, you get the so-called turbo equalizer versions of these uh, equalizers. You can also include channel estimation in your turbo loop because the soft estimates that you get for the symbols, you could actually use them as, train, as new training data to improve your channel estimate, right? And uh, so that can also help. And these are also things that, that we've done uh, in, the, in the past. Now, how do, did we apply this uh, multi-carrier, this OFDM setup that, that I just discussed in the, in the UCAC project? Uh, so remember, so the, the main idea there was to have long distances and to be covert. So we want to have signals that work at very low SNR. So there will be a lot of coding involved in, this, in these signals and a lot of uh, spreading of the signals. Now, what came out of the first C trial is that we talk about delay spreads in these environments and in these frequency bands of, yeah, they could go up to 100 or even 150 milliseconds, so pretty large uh, delay spreads. That means that if you, have a, a, if you design a cyclic prefix for OFDM, it has, to be, it has to cover this delay spread. Otherwise, you don't get this circular convolution that you can diagonalize. So we also have a, a cyclic prefix length that's, around, that's close to 150 milliseconds. Now, if, if you have such a large uh, CP length, if you want to be efficient, because this is actually basically redundant, uh, a redundant transmission, so if you want to be uh, spectrally efficient, you need a longer data symbol. So the data symbol should be much longer than this one. That's why we uh, went for an OVM period of 1.2 seconds, which is larger than this 150 milliseconds. So it's a pretty big symbol period, right? So if you compare this to the, to the radio world, this is, this is huge, right? And within 1.2 seconds, you can have a lot of time variation eh, from waves and from all kinds of uh, mobility effects. And this leads to a carrier spacing of 0.83 hertz. So if we talk about this bandwidth here of 3.6 kilohertz, we have a lot of carriers. So we have 4,320 carriers. That means if you want to sample uh, at the receiver at Nyquist rate, we will get 4,320 samples. And the number of channel taps at that rate would be 540. So because that will also be the, the CP length. So that means a lot of channel taps. And these channel estimation procedures I talked about, they are rather complex in the sense that they have a complexity that's quadratic in the, in the channel length. So it's not linear in the channel length. So the channel estimation complexity will be quadratic in this 540. So that's kind of, uh, that, that created a lot of uh, problems because it, it gets very complex. So that's why we decided to go for a multi-band approach. So to split the full band of 3.6 kilohertz into 16 smaller bands. And in every band, we use a smaller OVDM uh, setup. So every band here is using OVDM, but we use many bands in parallel. 
So the bands are different from the subcarriers. Huh? So within every band, you still have 256 subcarriers. And now we have only a CP length of 32 in every subband. So that's manageable in terms of channel estimation. And we use also guards of uh, 14 carriers in between the, the subbands. And so that can reduce the receiver complexity a lot because you kind of reduce also the length of the CP uh, in every subband. This is actually an approach that has also been used in, in ultra wideband uh, radio communications. They also, when they apply OVDM, they also go for a multi band uh, OVDM approach. So we kind of use the same here in the acoustic world. Um, then in terms of channel estimation, so we put a lot of training in there. So we had 256 carriers and we put 160 pilots there in terms of uh, clusters of length five. So every cluster has a non-zero pilot and some zero pilots around it. Why these guard bands? Well, they are basically there to capture the intercarrier interference. So this pilot, when you receive this pilot, it will shift in frequency over these uh, zero carriers. It has actually been shown that this is some kind of optimal training pattern in certain circumstances for these time varying channels. So we use some kind of an optimal training pattern. Then also because we want to go for very covert uh, communications, we're going to do a lot of spreading of the, of the information symbol. So every OVDM symbol will be spread over the different frequency bands and over time. So the red block here is one, one and the same OVDM symbol and it will be basically repeated in different bands, in different bands of these 16 subbands, and also in different time slots. So it's some kind of spreading that you do, a linear spreading operation. And then at the receiver, we don't equalize block per block, but we do some kind of joint equalization and despreading. I, I will not discuss that, but you can combine both uh, procedures. And that gives you then an estimate for this red block. On top of that, we do a lot of coding also to get the covert uh, uh, communication setup. We also had a, a low data rate and a high data rate setup. I'm not going to go into all the details, but uh, so we both of them use a rate one third uh, turbo code. Uh, on top of all the spreading that we do, for instance, in this low data rate, we have two of the M vectors. So we have one code block of two of the M vectors, which are spread actually over 21 time slots and 16 subbands. So there's a lot of spreading going on. And you see that that also reduces the data rate. So we're talking very low data rates here because we want to be covert. This one is a bit higher. So here we have three blocks of 10 of the M symbols that we spread over 17 slots and uh, 16 subbands. So in, in the C trial too, so all these different modulation formats, including the one I just showed, were, were tested. So I will not go into the detail of the spread spectrum and the, and the chirp modulation, but I will focus on the results of the OVM, which were, were the best among the three. So as a transmitter, uh, we used this transducer here, which was developed by, by Rezon. So this is this low frequency transducer. And the receiver was this uh, array of hydrophones so, so we could check the received signal at different depths because usually there's always an ideal depth where you get most of the energy. And th those results were used in the second C trial. So here on this transmitter, different waveforms were sent. One waveform for the CDMA, one waveform for multi-carrier, one waveform for the chirp and so on. And I show you two experiments. Many experiments were done, but I'll show you two here. So one was done in the Baltic Sea where the transmitter was fixed and the source level was just changing in steps of 2 dB. So it was decreased in, in steps of 2 dB and the distances were 8 and 52 kilometers. In case B, the transmitter was towed at a certain speed. So the source level was fixed, but the transmitter was towed. So you, you kind of create similar effects there. Here you see uh, some of the channel impulse responses and the, the uh, frequency responses of the channel. So the left column is the, the time domain and this is the frequency domain. So this is for these uh, fixed transmitter uh, cases. So this is case A, case A, the short distance and the long distance. So you see long distance, you get a kind of a longer delay spread. The Doppler spread seems to be a little bit smaller than in the, in the shorter channel. What's also typical for these underwater channels sometimes is that you get a crescendo of multipath, right? which is very untypical in the, in the, in the radio world. So the, the, the channel delay spreads, they, they could, could uh, the, the channel impulse responses in a time domain, they could look pretty weird sometimes. This is the case where we have a towed transmitter and you see that the Doppler spread increases a lot due to the mobility of the transmitter. Uh, 
Uh, remember that the carrier spacing was 0.84 hertz, so we get like a Doppler spread in the order of the in the order of the uh, carrier spacing. And you see also a lot of kind of a sparse impulse response in this case, uh, which also covers almost uh, the total of this 150 milliseconds. So it's really useful to 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 use a cyclic prefix of 150 milliseconds in these cases. Here you see some bit error rate curves. So this is for the case A, so where we have a fixed transmitter and the transmit level in every cycle is reduced by uh, 2 dB, and this is the received SNR. Uh, and on, on the, the, the numbers on top are basically the bit error rates for the high data rate case, and the numbers on the bottom are the bit error rates for the low data rate case. So you see in, the, in this short distance that for the low data rate we don't get any errors. Only for the high data rate at certain low SNRs, we're talking yeah, minus 12 dB, we get some uh, bit error rate. For the longer distance, of course, we get bit error rates uh, earlier because we reach these uh, low uh, SNRs earlier. You also see some crosses here. That means that the, the synchronization didn't work because there's a, a, a big part that I didn't discuss. That's the synchronization. So in order to decode the data, you first have to synchronize your signal. And that's also very problematic in, in underwater communication. So I didn't discuss that. But sometimes the synchronization doesn't work. And then you cannot decode your data. And this is for the toad case. So here you see that the received SNR goes a bit up and down because of the, the noise. So this dip here is due to some kind of shipping noise that was present at that, at that range. But you see that, again, the low data rate case was actually receiving no bitter rates all the way up to minus 15 uh, dB received SNR. Only the high data rate channels sometimes had some, some bit errors. And then, okay, very quickly, so this was the, the C trial 3, so this was the final demonstration of the, of the OVDM, uh, where in this case we had two uh, low frequency transducers, so one was mounted on this uh, underwater uh, vehicle, which is called Yugin, and one was then towed behind this uh, Nokken boat, so an communication link was now set up between the two, from Yugin to Nokken and the other way around. And, uh, okay, so... Uh, yeah, so this is the setup. So here is the Nokken, so the, here is the ship, and the, the underwater vehicle was circling around here in the Bjornafjorden. There were also some sonar boys that were acting as interceptors, so they were just doing some energy detection to see whether you could intercept the signal or not, whether they could hear anything. Um, and here, uh, so this was again the signal that was transmitted, so, uh, so this is in time, this is frequency, so the small bars are basically the, these are the high data rate signals, the longer bars are the low data rate signals, and you see that the SNR will decrease. So this is the waveform that is sent, just to see where, up to what SNR we can still recover. Uh, this was the, re the received result uh, at a range of 5.3 nautical miles. This was from the Yugen, from the underwater vehicle to the, to the ship. And you see only the first one, you can recognize something, but, but further down, you don't see the communication signal present anymore. But still, we can, we can do uh, recovery of, the, of those. So what you see here is actually in, in blue, you see a reconstruction of when a signal is present. So, this, uh, so you see the short ones are the high data rate, the long ones are the low data rate. And on top, if it's, you see a repetition of this one. And if it's green, it means you had a successful recovery. If it's red here, for instance, these are the high data rate signals that were not recovered uh, correctly. And okay, this is simply repeated here. And what you see the blue curve is what the energy detector saw, which was actually close to the, to the Yugen, to close to the transmitter in this case. And you see that only once in a while it goes beyond the threshold that you put. So here he recognizes some signals. But here there's also a region where he doesn't recognize any signal and still you can do uh, perfect recovery. And there are also many false alarms, as you can see. So the threshold is actually not put very, very high. So there's a big false alarm rate here. But it just shows you what the energy detection, what the energy detector sees. Uh, and this is for the case when the, the underwater vehicle is the receiver. Of course, the problem with this underwater vehicle as a receiver is that it makes a lot of noise himself because it's, it has this rotor. So it makes a lot of noise. So you see that also some of these repetitions here that's due to the to the engine of the, of the underwater vehicle. So the performance is a little bit worse here uh, in, this, in this setup. 
And you see also that uh, the, the energy detector actually captures a lot of peaks, but also a lot of spurious peaks, which are not really due to the, to the transmission. But you see, uh, a few, uh, you see less uh, uh, successful communication results here, although here at, at very low SNRs, you still have a good uh, successful uh, recovery. But in general, to conclude, so I hope I, we've shown here that, that multi-carrier modulation is a good modulation format for underwater communication. And it has been proven in this covert context as a successful uh, uh, method for uh, acoustic underwater communications. What's important to remember is that, that you have to exploit really this bandedness, this banded assumption of the, of the channel matrix in the frequency domain to uh, get low complexity equalizers that you can improve the performance by this windowing procedure. And that if you want to do channel estimation, you have to exploit the correlation of the channel, for instance, using this uh, basis expansion model. And that you can do all kinds of uh, iterative approaches and, and channel equalization and estimation to improve your uh, performance of the, of the system. And that uh, concludes this, this overview. So if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.